The Department of Law Enforcement has on their website in the left hand side about, I can't see it from here how far down it is, but there's sex, sex offender status on the right, on the left side there. You can click on the sex offenders, it'll bring up this page, and you can check on the sex offenders in your neighborhood, around your school, around the church, anywhere where you're concerned where your children are playing in the park. By hitting that brown box in the upper left hand corner, it'll bring up this page. You can either do a search by an offender's name, you can just search in the neighborhood, so you can go in there, you can type in the address of an area where you're concerned about, and it'll bring up a list as far out as a five mile radius of all the sex offenders in that neighborhood. And you can also bring up a map, so it'll bring up a map of that neighborhood, and it'll show you just exactly where they're living at. And the other option you've got there at the bottom, the email and IM search, is if your child is communicating with somebody, whether it's an instant message or an email, and you're suspicious about that email, you can get in there, you can send that instant message name or the email, it'll go to Tallahassee, they'll do a background search on where that email or IM comes back to, and they will send a lead out to a law enforcement agency in this jurisdiction to investigate that case. Another important site, is Take 25. The National Center for Missing and Exploiting Children celebrates Missing Children's Day every May. And this is one of the big events that they kick off in April, May, around that time. And basically what this site does is it gives parents the importance of sitting down and talking to your children. Taking 25 minutes just to open up the lines of communication with them so that if something happens to them online or just in life general that they feel uncomfortable about and need help, that you've already started the process of communicating with them. Another good site is Netsmarks. And what I like about this site is across the top there, it's got all kinds of different tabs. Whether you've got a child on the far right side, a small child, before they even get into school, you can go onto this site, the kids can go on there, play interactive games, and in the process of playing those games, they're learning internet safety. They've also got a tweens tab for the, for the kids who are a little bit older, elementary school, beginning of middle school. It gives them different uh, safety tips and things to be looking for online. You've got ones for the teenagers. It's got public, announcement, uh, public announcements for them. It gives them videos of kids who have been victimized and how they made mistakes to educate the children on things that they shouldn't be doing. There's a tab for law enforcement so that we can go in, stay briefed, get resources for doing public speeches and stuff. There's also one for teachers and for parents. If you go into these sites, it'll give you, because this technology is constantly changing, and as just soon as you think you've got a grasp on it and what's going on, there's something new out there that you've got to be briefed on. You can go onto that site, and anything that's new and upcoming, they'll be talking about there. And in the upper right-hand corner, that 411, if you type on that, it'll take you to another site, and that gives you an opportunity to communicate with somebody online. If you have a question or a concern or don't understand something, you can send an email to a specialist and they will answer your question for you. The Sheriff's Office also has a website. Um, we've got safety tips on there. You can check on local arrest different things that are going on in the community. We've also got a kid's safe zone down there. Um, and you see the picture there. It's very important, regardless of how old your child is, to make sure that you've got a current photograph of that child. I'm totally amazed on how many times we go out to missing children cases right here in Collier County, and when we get there, we can't even get a picture of the child so that we know what that child looks like. What the sheriff has done is we have got a system there and in different events throughout the year we will fingerprint your child so that you've got a card with fingerprints of your child in case you ever need to turn them over to law enforcement for any reason. We don't keep the fingerprints on file, we turn them over to you, but at least that way that you'll have a set of fingerprints for your child. We also give you an envelope so that you can do a buckle swab and collect DNA of your child and have your ch child's DNA in the home so that, God forbid, if that's ever needed, we've got DNA for your child. And then with that, you also get a picture of the child. 
so that even if you don't have any other pictures, you would at least have one from the fingerprint event. I'm going to put my number up here at the end. Um, if there's ever an occasion where you're concerned or have any questions and you can't get them answered, feel free to either email me or give me a call and I'll do whatever I can to help you. Thank you very much. Let me just, uh, before we take questions, let me just throw a couple of, of, of things out there. And uh, as you heard from Sergeant Becker right now, and this is really a message for students, um, you know, everything you put out there is there for life. Uh, and just a couple of statistics, you know, employers, future employers, are going to get hired now. They check social networks for potential hires. Uh, so the consequences of putting something out there that might seem innocent today and fun, uh, frankly, could be devastating in the future. Uh, but also, for example, uh, not only do employers look at that, but according to studies, more than 80% of college admission officers consider social media, uh, what's on the social media before they decide to recruit or accept a student. So the consequences of something that might sound innocent and, and, and cute today, pictures of people, you know, having parties or anything else, uh, could be devastating. Uh, tweets. What one puts as a tweet now, by the way, now, from now on, this is a relatively new thing, you know, tweets are not going to be stored in the Library of Congress. So, every tweet, think about this, every tweet that you throw out there and you figure, ah, you know, no big deal, that will be stored in the Library of Congress. So researchers, and individuals will be able to look at that for the rest of humanity as long as we're a country. So, and eventually, by the way, that will become public record. After a while, that will become public record. Just a couple things to keep in mind. Now, um, as far as, you know, you see all this and you think, yeah, but it's not gonna happen to my kid. You know, I've got a good relationship. My kids got their act together. Well, you heard from uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney Calderon, uh, some examples of if it's not going to, if it's somebody it shouldn't happen to, it's those examples that you gave. Parents who law enforcement and a teacher and the kid is homeschooled and they still get victimized. Keep that in mind. Let me just give you some other statistics. 75% uh, of children state that they are willing to share personal information online about themselves and their family in exchange for some good or some services. So, if you think your child won't do it innocently, hey, you know, just get some information. This is what you get in response, something innocent. 75% of children are willing to do that. Three-fourths of American teenagers, three-fourths of American teenagers say they've been bullied online. But here's the flip side of that. Only one in 10 tell their parents. This is according to a survey by UCLA. So just because they haven't told the parent, they haven't told you, remember, three-fourths say they've been bullied, and very few tell their parents. A couple other statistics. One in six teenage, uh, teens aged 12 to 18, one in six, have received sexually suggested or nude images of someone they know on their cell phone. 95% of teens ages 12 to 17 are online. 95% are online. About one third of online teens, ages 12 to 12 17, have been cyber bullied online. 97 of online teens, ages 12 to 17, play play computer games, web, portable, or console games. 97. And 27% of them uh, are gaming with people, communicating and gaming with people that they first met online. And you've heard tonight who some of those people may be. So I mention that just because, and I know it's, this is not a fun uh, forum tonight, but I mention that just to reiterate that this happens all the time. And it's up to us as parents 
to do what we can to protect our children. With that, we have some time for questions. And if we have any questions, take, let's take out this opportunity because we have an incredibly talented, dedicated group of experts here. If you all have any questions, I'm sure there'll be willing to take a few questions. Anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. So, so the reality is this. Yeah, there are laws, and, and, and the, the assistant uh, U.S. attorney mentioned you know, some of the statutes that, that, that she uses, and, and, and law enforcement use statutes. <laughs> but let's be very clear, and I think this is very important. We are not going to be able to keep up. Laws are not going to be able to keep up with technology. We're not. And I wish I could tell you otherwise. I'd like to believe that it could happen. Uh, so, which is one of the reasons that we're here tonight. Um, you're right. You know, your child may have downloaded a different, uh, a different surf engine. I hate to tell you this. We need to know those things as parents. We need to track our kids. We need to know what they're surfing, what technology they're using to surfing, who they're talking to. So, I wish I could tell you you know, you've got folks here who dedicate their lives to go after these predators. Uh, but these predators are now international. 
Uh, we were talking about a case here with the superintendent, a different case where a child was targeted. Uh, the predator targeted the child, wasn't in this part of the state, targeted the child for about a year. Finally, that one moment of they got the child to agree to make contact, this person was in Asia and they flew to Florida to make that contact. So they can do certain things, laws can do certain things, but frankly, I hate to put it in these terms, uh, as parents, we're the ones who are going to have to monitor you know, what comes into our computers, what comes into our child's cell phones. And we can use the laws, yes, to, 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 to try to go after some of those individuals. But if we think that the laws are going to be able to keep up with technology, and we expect technology or companies or the local or the state or the federal government to be able to keep up and you know, keep our kids free and safe and we don't have to worry much about it, I think that's, that's just a mistake. So I wish I could have had a wonderful, great, beautiful answer that don't worry about it. We're going to pass the laws. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, by the time we pass one law to deal with one of those issues that you mentioned, that technology has moved eons away from where we are today. So uh, that's, that's my stab at it. And I don't know if anybody else wants yeah, to. Pick, pick, piggyback on that just a little bit. You had mentioned the Internet providers. Uh, the Internet providers are great help to law enforcement. They're doing so many things as far as technology goes um, today that they weren't doing just two, three years ago. One of the things that they're doing is any image that's going over the internet, these internet providers are capturing all of those images. Uh, up at the National Center for Missing Exploiting Children, they've got a program up there called CVIM, and it's Victim Identification Program. So if there's an image out there that is a known child pornography image, uh, maybe it's just getting on the internet now, or it had just been identified because a case happened somewhere where we've identified a victim, we've got these images, we have the child's name now, they may have been on the internet for years, but we're now identifying who that child is and that it is child pornography. The internet providers are storing all of those images so they can actually pass on to law enforcement the first time that that image hit the internet and where it came from. So the internet providers are definitely progressive and doing what they can to protect the uh, communities. Um, but another thing, you know, we've got the First Amendment right out there and even though adult child pornography is on the internet, it's something that isn't necessarily illegal if used property, properly so it's out there and you know, obviously if, if an image goes to a child is sent to a child knowing that they're a child, there are criminal charges for that that we can pursue. But just child or just part pornography in general, being on the internet, um, unless laws change, there's not a whole lot we can do about that, unfortunately. Let me just one, one last thing, if I may pick back on what the sergeant just said. Remember, by the time a photograph gets on the internet, that's, frankly, in many cases, a lot has taken place before that. Uh, and that's where I think as parents, we need to try to do what we can to not allow it to get to that stage. Uh, but, and that's, that's our challenge as parents. Questions, comments? Yes. Karen is doing her best with the Vanna White invitation here. picture ends up in a whole bunch of different schools. What happens to the child that originated the picture? Are you talking about child pornography? Or yes, the well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, obviously, and that's, that's the big problem we dealt with, like I said, going back about five or six years. We had all these kids in the school system sending nude photographs of themselves to their friends or to their boyfriends. And we try to convey to them that, listen, just because that individual is your boyfriend or girlfriend today doesn't mean they're going to be your boyfriend or girlfriend tomorrow. And when they get upset with you, that image is gone. 
Um, the way the statutes were set up in Florida was they were in possession of child pornography. If they sent it, you're looking at distribution, which is offenses that are going to make that juvenile a sexual offender and be on the sexual offender registry for anywhere from 25 years to the rest of their life. Now, is it fair for that to happen? Obviously, if it's an isolated incident, we thought that it was more important to educate the children of the dangers of it. So we didn't pursue it criminally. We would get out, we try to identify the image, who it was, who they sent it to, where it had been sent to, and try the best we could to make sure that it didn't hit the internet. Obviously, you never know for sure. Um, Florida legislators have recently changed to where if a juvenile is sexting images, it's community service for the first event. They will get community service. They'll have to do so many hours. If a second event comes up, we can pursue a misdemeanor against them. That way we're trying to get the point across to them, but not charging them with a felony and not making them a sex offender. But if it happens a third time, that's when it becomes a felony, and that's where it could be pursued as possession of child pornography or distribution of child pornography and the consequences that come with that and more. Are there consequences for, I mean, there should be consequences for the parent if it goes on, or are, there's nothing they can... Well, in the process of educating the juveniles, we're also educating the parents. Um, you know, we try to explain to them the dangers that their child is putting themselves in and offer them any resources that we can to try to uh, make sure that they're well adversed of the dangers and to make sure it doesn't happen in the future. Thank you. For the questions, comments? All right, Karen. By the way, Karen, don't, ne don't neglect this slide later. <laughs> okay, there's somebody's here? Ah, okay. He's here. Great, thank you. Well, no, why don't you do that one and then why don't you, uh, so we just want to make sure that we, everybody gets a chance. Yes, please. Who's, who's next? I just have a comment. Um, a suggestion to parents. These smartphones are computers and this whole keep it in a central location doesn't fly so much anymore with smartphones because they're taking them in their bedrooms, they're on the buses, they're everywhere. Um, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock comes around, these should be on your nightstands charging for the night. Shouldn't be in your, parent, in your um, <clears throat> kids' bedrooms. Secondly, I don't know, because I didn't expect to, to say this, but there was a study done of middle schoolers. And about 95% of them would not tell their parents if they were being cyberbullied. And there was a couple of reasons, but the number one reason for that, meaning 5% would tell. The reason for that was because they were afraid that they would be punished and that these would be taken away. So in our communications with our kids, we need to have a conversation, but we also need to remember as parents not to have a knee-jerk reaction, taking these from them, our, their smartphones, their world, you know, to their text messages are our note passing of years gone by. So. It is the wild, wild west and the internet, and there's adventure there, but there's also danger. And we need to remember not, not to have that knee-jerk reaction and yank that phone out of their hands, or take that laptop and throw it in the trunk of our car and take it around with us the rest of the day. But to have a conversation so that they will come to you and tell you when something happens. Great point. Great, great point. I'm just wondering, are there sessions like this for the kids? Because I have four children, and I can tell them something all day long until I'm blue in the face, but it's just mom. And we have an open communication system in our home, but as with anything, honey, that doesn't match. It matches until their friends tell them that doesn't match. So... With something of this magnitude, when we talk about it as parents, a lot of times kids just shut down. So is there something like this for the kids 
so that they can understand, you know, what your parents are telling you really is the truth, that th there are dangers out there. It's a great tool, and we tell the kids that the Internet is such a great tool, and it is if it's used properly. So what else can we do other than communicating with our children to have sessions like this where I can bring my children and I can say, these things have happened, and almost just, you know, it's a, it's a scared straight kind of thing. So is that, is that available in our community? So, so let me take a stand at that one. So we're actually going to be um, implementing uh, bring your own device to school because what we found is that, believe it or not, 20% of our Wi-Fi usage is actually not our employees. So who is that telling you using the phones or the Wi-Fi? It's our students. So rather than fight the cause, we want to instead embrace that. So we'll be phasing in in three phases to get through all of our schools. We took, um, I was just mentioning, we took a team of 30 of us up to Foresight, Georgia last month. So the week, and it was principal and teacher from the 11 schools, Title I, non-Title I, elementary, middle, and high school. So as we roll this out, registering the devices on phone, that'll be a component that we want to ensure that we just don't have the kids use devices, but also in, include a safety thing. So next year when we do my third year of town hall meetings, that'll be another time that we actually work on that. We also have been putting together this current year parent academy, so we're going to be holding the parent academy on social media at the um, Children's Museum here. They're opening up um, their venue for us, and that's in the next two or three weeks. It's on our website. So we realize that it is a combination, like in education, it's never about just the schools, it's always the combination of schools and homes. It's a trickier world for our kids, so we know that we can use these devices as tools in a very appropriate way, but that will also help work. And again, I would just mention um, that partnership that we have with the Sheriff's Office and the YRBs. So we'll be doing more of those kind of um, joint partnerships on these exact topics because it's part of our obligation, especially as we ask, ask the kids and open that world a little bit, um, not a little bit, a lot more focused on how to use them educationally, but also help teach them those um, important lessons that we've heard tonight. The FBI also has an uh, education program that we do through the schools where we bring out a victim who is now an adult who was victimized when she was a juvenile. And she talks about how she was lured into being a victim. And then the program itself, uh, which is based around a cyberbullying incident, when I've been uh, uh, there at the, the classroom, there hasn't been a dry eye at the end of it. All the kids are crying. Uh, I think they get a, a really good understanding of what cyberbullying does to the victim who's being bullied and gives them an opportunity to see a different side of the situation. So we do offer that and we also offer a training program for school resource officers <coughs> in law enforcement to, uh, to teach that program as well. What else? You all see? I think as we roll these things out together, we'll take the best of all the pieces so that we can provide those opportunities. And I'd just like to add something also real quick. Um, she mentioned earlier the partnership that we've had with the school system. In the past, we have worked with the National Center with their public service announcements, and we had them shown during the morning announcements at different times throughout the year. So we would pick an announcement that might apply to something that's going on at that time, and it would be playing during the morning announcement so that the kids would see that in the morning. And just to piggyback for an additional answer, I know that the Sheriff's Office, um, Corporal Springer, has worked with the Title I schools um, here um, in Collier County and did four presentations to uh, local Title I schools and is available to come out to do internet safety, cyberbullying, and just an overall safety issue um, and you can usually contact her through um, Captain Jones through the Sheriff's Office to do a presentation at any local organization or school. 
And on our education channel, too, that's our other avenue. We're on Comcast 99 that we'll be making sure that people can get right to a direct link off our homepage. We're having a hard time because the lights are pretty bright, so if I'm going to rely on, uh, on my staff to let us know if we have any further questions. No. No? I have four daughters and um, had to have some conversations with the boyfriend several times about this kind of a sexting situation. And if, uh, if I had had that ammunition about uh, uh, the consequences, the legal consequences they could have faced, uh, I, I had no idea these young boys could be put on a sexual predators list for 25 years. My conversation with them might have gone a little different. Is that data going to be part of the school programs that you, that the, uh, the superintendent and you, sir, also have put together? So, again, I think one of the things that, again, I keep referring to the sheriff's office, but they really have been a phenomenal partner with us just recently with the, um, following the Sandy Hook, we already had outstanding um, procedures, but like everyone, we rechecked, relooked, and we then jointly created a um, video that went to all 7,000 of our employees. So as we move forward, we'll be certain that these kind of things that is there developed, that they're not done exclusively on our end, but again, in partnership, and then also looking into the other services that you hear tonight. We'll just be sure that those things are pushed out. That's why we ask for folks. And if you haven't given us your um, email address, we promise you we don't bombard your emails. We promise you it's easy to sign up. So we have 27,000 emails. So that's what we we're trying to build that database so that as we create these different tools for parents, that we can also send those out electronically to links too, to again help further that cyber safety issues that we're now um, working with. I also want to refer you that in your folders you have a lot of information. There's other stuff out there, but you have a lot of information. There's a lot of useful information there. There's also a lot of places there where you can get further information, and um, I think you'll find them to be good resources. And uh, you're absolutely right. You know, knowledge is, uh, uh, is a very powerful weapon uh, in this case. Okay, I think, yes? All right, let me, let me then, uh, first, has this been useful to you? Yes. Yes? yes. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, because I got involved in this because it scared the heck out of me. A few years ago, 2007, when I started doing this, we, our staff and I started doing this because, uh, because we learned about this stuff. And as a parent, uh, this should concern us all. And I'm hoping that uh, you've heard something tonight that uh, you find useful. Uh, I'm also hoping, by the way, that you will obviously speak to your children. But I ask you to do something else. Speak to your friends and neighbors. Let them know about the risk that that beautiful, wonderful tool of the internet is. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful tool, but let them know about the risk that is involved. Let them know that that you know game console that they bought their kid is a wonderful gift for you know for Christmas or birthday. Uh, could also be a tool for a predator, for a pedophile, uh, to make contact with them. Let them know about the resources that are available. So I ask you to just, uh, when you go home tonight, obviously first thing, make sure that uh, we do what we can to keep our kids safe. But I think spreading the word is also very key. And I will end with uh, asking, actually speaking on your behalf, if I may be so bold, and I know I can do so. Uh, let me thank this panel of men and women who, as I said, stated at the beginning, dedicate their lives so that the lives of our children and our families remain safe. Let's give them, please, a round of applause. Thank you for your service to our country, but thank you, sir, for your service to our families and our children. Uh, and with that, I thank you very much. Please drive carefully, and thank you for being here. Oh, by the way, uh, one more thing. Uh, this presentation will be on uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, you can, you can, so you'll be able to get this entire presentation. Uh, Mammy talked about, I don't know if this is something that your, your children might 
uh, one of either, there may be parts that you might uh, think are helpful. Uh, that information is also, it should be in your, uh, in your folder. But please, feel free to contact any of us uh, if you need further information. Uh, thank you so very much. Please drive carefully. Bless you all. Thank you.